Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, as I get uh, ready to share today's webinar, I just want to welcome everybody. What we're going to do is we'll get started. Before we get going, I just wanted to touch base just with a couple of kind of housekeeping items, and then we'll jump into it. I'll chat for roughly 45 minutes, maybe a little bit less. There will be the opportunity to add any questions into your Q&A box that can be found traditionally at the bottom of your screen. As well, we're going to have a couple of polls throughout the session today. And like I said, I think the, time, the uh, information today will both be timely and relevant, uh, especially what's uh, gone on over the last few days. So without further ado, I'm going to get going. So today, the key point. So we're going to look back at what's occurred since the last time we met. So roughly seven to eight weeks. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the current market comments and uh, navigating the noise. And before I start with our first poll, I just thought I would mention, you know, when I put together these comments and information, uh, generally speaking, what I do is I actually start to um, uh, put together a lot of the information two, three, four weeks ahead of time. And this past weekend, I actually uh, pretty much finalized the information. And it's incredible what 24 hours can do. So I've left most of the presentation the same, but I have added a few slides this morning and have some uh, further comments as well. So. Um, so first one, uh, what's most top of mind? So we'll start here. So there's going to be four questions here. What's most top of mind for you guys today? Uh, again, I would encourage you to um, uh, answer these questions. There's uh, uh, four items. You know, number one, market uncertainty. Number two, inflation and the rising cost of goods. Uh, retirement, how will the markets affect you? And then lastly, tax planning. So how can I protect my assets from CRA? So there's the poll. So what's top of mind for you? So again, you know, pick the one that is uh, most top of mind. And um, we'll just give you a couple seconds here to, uh, uh, to answer. So I thought I would start with this first here. And it says, you know, what round are we in? So, you know, I, I, I came across this. I thought it was kind of funny, you know, the bull and the bear kind of fighting each other. And the last, you know, six to eight weeks has actually been just that. We've actually had some uh, good markets. Uh, and then we've been, it's been followed with some choppy markets uh, and time will tell, you know, this bear market now, you know, we're, we're a good way into it. Uh, you know, we're likely on the back end, but we are still seeing some uh, ongoing um, um, choppiness in the markets for a number of different reasons. And I'm going to revisit some of the things that we talked about last time and actually give you some fresh opinions. So let's look back at what's happened. So here's the market snapshot year to date, guys. So, you know, if we look at the major uh, markets, both here in North America and then also the global markets, you know, the TSX has still been the best performing market, but that's largely because, um, you know, energy and commodities were very rich in that. You know, it's a very narrow market. You know, we've discussed this before. You know, it's primarily made up of three sectors, you know, financials being the largest. And I'll talk about this briefly in a little bit. And then energy and commodities. So it's actually... Um, helped somewhat with the um, uh, returns overall. You know, when we look at the more broad markets, the S&P 500, we look at the growth market, NASDAQ, you know, they're down anywhere between 14 to 25%. Um, when I did the um, um, data, when I did the calculations from the last webinar, you know, when I, when I finalized this on Monday, you know, the gains over the last seven to eight weeks were all positive, some as much as 4%. But yesterday was a really tough day in the market. And it was a tough day in the market because it wasn't because inflation didn't come down. It was because it didn't come down enough. So, you know, we had a substantial sell-off. You know, we hadn't seen a decline like this since June of 2020. It was probably the worst day in almost in over two years. And it's actually brought the market down to pretty much flat. So it's basically eroded, you know, a lot of the gains that we'd experienced over the last seven to eight weeks. So for some of you that are looking at it, it's a little bit jarring. I mean, those numbers and, and the red across the screen yesterday, um, it was a big number. You know, it was a big number and the percentages were between three to four percent, you know, in North America uh, outside of the TSX. And it can be a little unnerving. But essentially what's happened is markets have come up off their bottom and they've just come back down based on some of this economic news. So really, we haven't actually fallen to new lows. We've just simply given away some of the gains that the market, market has been chugging uh, back on, on some of the previous lows that we saw in June. So let's look at what transpired before Tuesday. You know, if we had had this webinar on, on Monday, most individuals that are attending today would have been actually been quite pleased with how things had gone uh, since June, which was the worst month since 2020. 
So July was actually one of the best months that we had seen in ages. It was actually one of the best summer rallies ever. And if we go back to the, the different summer rallies and go back to all the way to 1928, you know, and I put this dotted line across it, we can see there's only been roughly four or five, you know, July and August's uh, returns that have been comparable to what we just went through. OK, and what's essentially happened is we've had a really good July. We had a good first part of August. And then some of that noise has crept back into the market. OK, inflation numbers have come back up. Interest rates have, are coming back up again. So the key things here is, you know, we just have to kind of put some things in perspective. And as, as the markets grind out of this bear market, we're going to have some more of these um, ups and downs. So don't be surprised, you know, if, if we actually see uh, uh, more of these types of, of volatile kind of days or few couple days. Okay. So I mentioned that the, the bond or the equity markets posted one of their best um, uh, months in recent history. Well, here's the bond market. Okay. The bond market, which is interesting, and this is what a lot of Canadians, this is what they invest 30, 40, 50% of their money in to hedge against the equity markets. Well, here's the first time, if you go back, this is one of the first times in our lifetime that, a, that the bond market is actually in a bear market territory. So it's highly unusual to see a stock market, equity markets, and actually bond markets, both post bear market or be in bear markets. So the challenge right now are the more defensive investments that most Canadians use, they're, uh, they've actually declined in some cases more than what equity markets have done. You know, one of the benefits that we've done for a lot of our families, including most people that are attending on this call, you know, we've introduced alternative type asset classes similar to pension plans. Okay, so we have private equity, we have private real estate, private debt, and as a whole, they've all have performed the more traditional, you know, more defensive type investments. And yes, they're all going to fluctuate in value sometimes over the long run. But what we found is that by utilizing some of these alternative asset classes, and again, this is what a lot of these big pension plans and endowment funds and so on have found, that it actually reduces the risk overall, and it actually generates more stronger and consistent returns. Okay, so let's just look at the bond a little bit more to kind of put it in perspective. So these are basically four charts, okay, and there's various charts. This is the aggregate bond. This is the year-to-date return. We're looking at government bonds. We have investment-grade bonds, and then we have high-yield bonds. So if you actually look at all of them, the 2022 performance, you know, we haven't seen these since the 1970s and 1980s. It's actually performed much worse than what, what historically it's done. And it's not in just one specific type of bond. It's in bonds in general. OK, now, before I move on to, um, you know, some other items, I just want to comment at some point, there will likely be a decent trade in bonds. We're likely going to get some recovery in bonds. The challenge right now is that we anticipate central banks, including the Bank of Canada, to continue to increase interest rates. I mentioned last time we spoke, and I might be taking away some of my thunder and some of the other slides, but I said to everybody, I said, listen, we anticipate at least another 1% hike, okay? Whether they did it all in one shot or they did it over a couple, you know, the, the, the Bank of Canada target rate is between 35 to 4%. OK, we're not quite there yet. So I still believe there's probably at least another 50 to 75 basis points in Canada that they're going to continue to hike potentially. And in the U.S., they're a little bit behind Canada because you know, every time we hike, their data comes out a little bit later and then they hike as well. So I would anticipate a 75 percent to 1 percent hike you know, coming up. And what that means is um, bonds will still continue to struggle because as rates go up, your bond values go down, okay? So I just want to switch gears here before I jump into kind of some inflation comments because of what's happened over the last couple of days. But I had somebody in our survey last time, they said, hey, you know, can you mention a couple of comments about crypto, cryptocurrency? And here's a good example. So I, this chart I actually had come across my desk probably about a week and a half ago. And just like what it was saying, it says Bit Bitcoin's intraday swings are lessening. So folks, Digital currency, and I'll talk about the two big ones, Bitcoin and Ethereum, okay, they are highly uh, volatile. A lot of individuals had made a lot of money, you know, up to about a year ago, and since then, they've been in a constant state of decline. They've actually lost almost 60% of their value uh, over the last 12 months. Now, the actual um, 
the concept of digital currency, I still believe that over the long run, there's going to be some merits for it. The problem is there's just so many digital currencies out there and a lot of them are failing, but you know, you have these bigger ones, Bitcoin and Ethereum, but it's, they're, they're, they're very uh, speculative. They're not uh, very well um, uh, uh, regulated. So what happens, you get a lot of these big swings. So I noted this and I put this here in the yellow. You can see the intraday swings have come down significantly in the last year. So here's what's happened, you know, as we ended last year into this year, and then it's come down. Well, guess what, guys? With the actual talk of the U.S. increasing interest rates because inflation not coming down as much as possible, this is what they did yesterday. Okay, both digital, both uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum were down between eight to ten percent in one day. Okay, and that is not a surprise because typically in inflationary times and interest rates that are hiking, what we've actually seen in the last number of hikes, we tend to see a little bit of a pullback in these. So, you know, markets were down between two to 4% yesterday. Uh, some of these other asset classes, if you want to call them Ethereum and Bitcoin, uh, down almost two to three times as much as that. So, you know, we haven't actually um, added a lot of digital currency in the portfolio. Uh, not to say there's not a future for it, but for a lot of folks that are on this call, the volatility isn't what a lot of people are looking for. It's a lot of fun to participate in these types of investments when the markets are going up significantly, but no one likes to actually see the volatility like we're seeing right now. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about inflation, which is causing some of the market rift right now. So, you know, here's again another one I came across, you know, Chairman Powell, what's your view of inflation? Um, you know, he's kind of, you know, out of sight, out of mind. Unfortunately, they, there hasn't been a lot of great leadership out of the U.S. on how they're dealing with this. And if you go back to 9, 10, 12 months ago, you know, the opinion back then is back then was that it was going to be a soft landing. You know, there wasn't a lot of concern about inflation. And here we are you know, 9, 10, 12 months after they, they mentioned that, and they're struggling to get ahead of it, okay? Now, it's not all bad news, okay? And again, it's putting it in perspective. So inflation in the U.S. and in Canada, they have slowed for two straight months, okay? So despite the rhetoric that we heard yesterday, the reason why we saw such a swing in the markets, because of the inflation number not being as, as um, low as anticipated, and guys, it was 0.03 to 0.01 or 0.1 to 0.3, that was the difference. But because they anticipated it to be lower, they, um, they felt that the US Fed was likely going to only uh, increase rates by 0.75%. But because it didn't fall as much as they thought, now there's concern that they might hike as much as 1%. Okay, so and I want to I want to pause here for a quick sec, and I want to talk a little bit about the markets and how a market prices in future results today. Okay, because it's going to be a little bit of a theme in some of these other slides. So let me give you an example. If the market, the equity markets, if they anticipate or the economists anticipate uh, a, a rate hike of say seventy five basis points. The market doesn't wait until they increase by 75 basis points or 0.75. The market will actually start to react today. So it's a little bit difficult to think about interest rates. But if, if I break it down uh, from a corporate point of view and give an example of a company, it's a little easier to, di to digest. So let's say we have ABC Widget Company. Okay, Instead of using a real company, I don't want to confuse whether they're on track or not. But let's just say we use a fictitious a company, ABC Widget, and they have revenue that happens year over year. And all of a sudden, their president comes out and they say, hey, listen, you know, the economy is slowing and our profits, our sales that we've had in previous years, we actually think it's going to be less in the future because we see this, this contraction in the economy. OK, so instead of our sales being, you know, what they were in the past, they're going to go down 50 percent. OK, and if sales go down 50 percent, it means profits are going to go down 50 percent, roughly speaking. OK, well, what the market does with that company, if it's traded publicly, that share price will actually go down today based on the future earnings of that company. OK, so what happens is there's an immediate reaction. And then let's say six months goes by and, and, and the target is right on that price stays the same. Until all of a sudden they say, hey, we think our earnings or our, our sales are going to go up and our profits are going to go up. And then the actual price of that share starts to go up in anticipation. 
Okay. Now, if we go back one second, if that same company we're thinking is going to contract and therefore the price of the stock goes down, if six months goes by, and let's say they sign a big contract that they didn't anticipate and their sales are way greater and they report, then what's going to happen is that share price is going to go up. Okay. So often again, and I, I've said this before, markets tend to lead us into an economic downturn and they lead us out of an economic downturn. And I will give you a very good example in about three or four slides from now. Okay. I hope that made sense that that whole, you know, the price adjusting before reality hits. Okay. So just three, three um, uh, markets or countries or, or economies where the inflation numbers are. So I thought I would look, you know, from a, from a micro point of view. So here's Canada, you know, we can see actually, you know, inflation rapidly increased and we've actually started to actually plateau, which is what I actually mentioned last webinar is that we anticipate inflation plateauing a little bit and that's exactly what's happening but despite this you know the bank of canada we still think are going to hike now they could slow down they can pause but we do think they're still going to want to try and get ahead of this uh you know before it actually kind of you know reverses and goes up okay so this is in canada you know, here's the U.S. and this is a this is a table that goes back to the to 2000. But in 2022, we can actually see you know inflation rising in the beginning of the year. It peaked in June, and it's actually fallen the two subsequent months. Okay, now again, they were anticipating this to come in around 8.1, so still less than last month. But because it came in higher than anticipated, again, there's panic in the markets because now the U.S. Fed they're anticipating that they're gonna hike 1% versus the 0.75 that was already priced in, okay? And then in the UK, this is a fresh chart. This came out, I just came across my desk this morning. Now the UK has some significant issues, guys, and I don't wanna sweep it under the rug, the rug to say everything is great. You know, they have soaring energy costs. You know, if anybody has been watching, um, you know, the, the government has put in some um, uh, caps on how much people can pay their, their um, um, providing a lot of money, a lot of stimulus around energy. So inflation has been on a tear there, okay? But what we've seen is the UK inflation dipped for the first time in almost a year. Now, I don't know what the next couple of months will be because generally speaking, you know, it's those, those energy numbers that are really going to drive it. We're going into the winter months. So this could very well go back up again. But again, the fact that it's that's a somewhat peach, you know, time will tell if it follows suit with some of the, you know, North American economies here. And again, I think if central banks and again, the, the, the uh, ECB has hiked again. So I think if they can get ahead of this thing, you know, obviously we're just looking for some positive news as it relates to inflation. So here's one other good chart here. So if you look at inflation spikes, and again, I'm spending a little bit more time on this because the, the, the news yesterday was very timely. And you know, I've had some questions, uh, you know, more questions about inflation in the last 24 hours than I've had in the last few weeks. So when we look historically speaking, you know, again, we don't know what happens tomorrow, but we can look back on data. You know, if we look here, and I made a couple of points, you know, inflation spikes don't traditionally last as long as this has been. The current run up is 22 months. Generally, on average, the longest ones don't persist much more than 24 months. So we're near that back half. Okay. And if we look at where we are today, you know, this dotted line is current. You know, if we look back at history, and this goes back over 100 years, you can actually see these run ups at various points in history. There's very few of them. Here's where we are today. Again, here's where we are. This is back in the 80s, 70s, you know, back in the 20s. So again, we need to weather this storm, the, the central banks have to get ahead of it. But generally speaking, when we go back on 100 years of data, you know, it's looking like we're near the tail end of this run up. So again, we could see some plateauing, which means that we're going to likely get some relief on the interest rates. So a good segue here. So when we look at the Bank of Canada, the interest rates and their game plan, you know, this goes out to 2024, the future. You know, here's a good example. You know, again, they want to try and get to that three and a half to four percent. You know, here's kind of where that plateau 3.75. You know, there's chatter that they might get to four percent. Um, but again, I'm not quite sure, you know, I, I do believe 50 to 75 basis points more, and then I think they'll pause a little bit, but don't be surprised the next rate announcement, obviously the U S fed will be anywhere from 75, uh, 0.75 to, to 1%. Uh, but again, I think it'll kind of tailor off as we get through the balance of the year. So again, just a really quick question again. So, you know, 
you know, I'm going to, I'm going to move on to recession. This is kind of the chatter that we're seeing out here. This is the next, you know, the next leg, the next uh, topic that we're going to likely see over the next few weeks. Okay. And we're starting to see it a little bit more. If you were to actually look at kind of Google trends, kind of from a search point of view, um, recession is at an all time high. It hasn't been this high in, in decades. You know, it's one of the top things that people are actually uh, I'm Googling right now, you know, about whether we're going to go into a recession. So I want to give a little bit of perspective and data on recessions. And that's the one chart I'm going to talk about, you know, the markets leading us into a recession or an economic downturn, and then the markets leading us out. Okay. Uh, I think we were going to put a poll up really quickly. Uh, I don't know if we have the time. So here we go. So how concerned are you about a recession? Number one, uh, very. Uh, number two, somewhat. And then last one, uh, not at all. So just check one of those there. Uh, just kind of give us an idea of, of, of kind of where your mindset is. Um, if you guys could do that, that would be great. Let's give you guys a couple of seconds to reach for your mouse to click on it. All right, so I'm going to move on to the next one here. So here's a couple of charts here for you guys. So the recession, so kind of misery loves company. So this is an index. It's called the, It's actually called the misery index, guys. Um, and if we actually look in the US, the UK, and then Euro, uh, you know, outside of UK, if we actually look at it where we are today, this is the pandemic. You know, this is obviously in the US, but a fairly significant spike. And here's where we are today. Okay, so so people are feeling you know, emotionally, they're kind of feeling a little bit beat up, and they feel like we're already in this recession. It hasn't officially been announced, but that's not unusual. What likely happens? You know, is the economists or the powers that be will actually look backwards facing or backwards looking, and they'll see that GDP has contracted over two consecutive quarters. And then they'll come out and they'll say, hey, you know what? The recession started, you know, X amount of months ago. Okay. And that's when they'll say that we're in a recession. So we could very well be in a recession. You know, we could have already been well in a recession for the last couple of months, but we don't feel like that. But now as things are kind of grinding a little bit, now we're starting to emotionally feel beat up a little bit. Okay, and if we look at recession, so again, this is the S&P 500, but this again goes back almost 100 years of data, and it shows the various recessions and the bottoms of the, the markets, and you can see, you know, in general, the S&P 500 goes up despite all these various recessions that happen along the way, and the last one we had, you know, put in perspective, 2020, it was very short. The recession lasted only a couple of months. So we really haven't had a more prolonged recession since 2008 and 2009. So it's been a long time. We just forget what it feels like. We haven't had this contraction in the markets, a sustained contraction in almost 13 years. And these contractions are common. You know, generally speaking, they used to last or they used to happen every six to eight years. But this has one of been, the, been one of the longest uptrends uh, in, in recent memory. And as a matter of fact, almost in history on the S&P 500. So this is, this is the chart I was talking about. And I think this is really important, okay? Because generally speaking, when we get to the point of where we are in the markets, and again, goes back to that kind of graphic I had about the bull and the bear, you know, boxing it out, we all get a little bit tired, okay? We get tired of seeing the markets go up. We get tired of seeing the markets go down. We just want some consistent upward trend, okay? We want to feel good. And so right now, we're, we're, you know, the markets are working through it. So what happens is we start asking questions. We, we say, hey, should we be going to cash? Should we be buying GICs? Should we be shifting our approach to the markets? And the answer is absolutely not. Unless, unless something has changed specifically in your situation, the way the portfolios are, are positioned is in anticipation of these choppiness. And we've been actually anticipating this type of slowdown for quite some time. So we've actually already been proactive of actually increasing, you know, your more conservative investments within the portfolio. And for the large part, the performance of the portfolio is, is, is performing exactly as designed, which is to fall less than the markets, okay? Now, you know, again, it's, it's human nature to say, hey, should I actually be making changes today? Because again, the news kind of gets, it gets to the worst before it gets better. Well, here is um, a chart, okay? We go back to 2008 and 2009. And I'm not saying this is where we are, folks, but we are getting here, okay? So on March 8th of 2008, we were still in a bear market. But on March 9th of 2009, that's when that next bull market began. 
The problem is we didn't know we were in a bull market until we got to, you know, 20% on the upside around here. Okay. So the bull market started March 9th. Okay. But it wasn't until July 23rd of that year that the um, OECD, they, they came out and they actually said, folks, the recession has ended. Okay, in the meantime, the markets gained, if we look here, and these are the same markets I showed before, TSX, Dow Jones, S&P, Global, the growth one, NASDAQ. Well, if we look at these, look at the returns that happened while we were still in a recession. Okay, the first four months of that, they are the end of the recession, markets gained between 40 to 56%. Okay, so I'm not suggesting... I don't want to say past, you know, the you know, past history is what's going to happen in the future, but we will see some significant gains before the recession is official, officially announced that it's ended. And we just have to go back as, as, as uh, close as July, you know, a month and a half ago, July was one of the best months on record. Okay. We had significant gains in a very short period of time. Okay. But we're still in this economic grind. So what's going to happen is we're going to get a couple of Julys in a row, as opposed to July and then a sluggish August into September. What's going to happen is we're going to get July, August, September, November. And all of a sudden now, it's going to be like a snowball where we're going to get multiple positive uh, weeks of decent returns. Okay. Now, through this gain, you can see there's little dips. Okay. And this is kind of common. The question, you know, at one point, you know, that dip is not going to go lower. It's going to continue to go up. And the challenge, folks, is we don't know what that day is. And I remember in 2009, you know, we had a family that we were working with. And I remember an email very specifically. It said, you know, folks, we have no idea today is the very first day of the next bull market. And by fluke, it actually was, you know. So it's just it's important to put that in perspective. All right, I'm going to switch here. So I kind of talked about where we're at. I've talked about inflation. I've talked a little bit about the markets, the recession. You know, again, I'm trying to provide a little bit of context and perspective there. Now I'm going to switch into just navigating the noise. Okay. Because again, it's really about managing emotions right now. You know, fundamentally, talked about it last time, there's a lot of great companies out there. They're just going through a period of contraction, but they're going to go through periods of growth again. It's just a matter of time. Okay. So I talked about Warren Buffett last time. Today, I'm just going to talk a little bit about Peter Lynch, who's another um, uh, significant investor in our lifetime. He's, he was a genius. And what he said, the key to making money in stocks is not to get scared out of them. And again, he's talking about emotional investing. So if we look at the top companies on the S&P 500, you know, we have mostly tech companies that actually rule the top. Okay, the tech companies, roughly speaking, this changes, you know, what have changed in the last couple of days, but, you know, roughly 20 odd percent is in the top five companies. It's actually probably greater than that. So you have to keep that in mind. You know, generally speaking, we think about growth companies, we think about it on the NASDAQ, but there's a lot of companies that actually overlap. So, you know, the NASDAQ really gets beat up. Well, unfortunately, so does the S&P 500. Okay, so, but it's broad. There's a lot of companies in the S&P 500. In Canada, not so much. We can see here, you know, most of the, the, the weightings in Canada are in financials. Okay, that they provide good dividends. There's only really six major banks, strong dividends, they're well capitalized, loan losses are well within reason. Um, you know, I still think they're going to do well, they're going to go through some periods of contraction here, just like everything else. But, you know, in 2008, nine, to give you kind of fresh perspective, you know, they struggled, because everything struggled, but they still made money, they just made less of it at that time. Okay, that being said, their stock was down 30, or actually, sorry, the stock was down between 60 to 70% in 2008 and nine, okay? Bank of Montreal was paying almost a 13% dividend back then, okay? They were well capitalized. Again, they never lost money, but their shares lost money because in the US, obviously we had a significant financial uh, meltdown that just contagion and just it bled over into Canada. And they just said, well, if it happens in the States, it's gonna happen in Canada, which wasn't the case. So already we have financials. Again, we have energy materials. Those are the big three. I mentioned those earlier. Um, energy right now, again, you know, I think we're actually positioned pretty well. And you know, we still think energy has a little bit of legs, even though oil is contracting somewhat. Um, so again, you know, these are the big three areas. So not quite as diversified as the U.S. So it's important that we have a blend of them. And again, I thought I would just, you know, provide this, you know, traditionally in September, it's the worst month in the markets. Again, going back almost 100 years. Generally speaking, September is the worst month. 
uh, on average, it's yielded, you know, 1% negative, but we've had some really big negative months in there. Okay, and same with October. But generally, as we get into the latter part of the year and into the first quarter of the new year, things tend to get a little bit stronger. And again, revisiting from what I talked about last time, I talked about emotional investing. So just a reminder, for those of you that attended the last webinar, this is a refresher. For those of you that didn't, this will be new. But if we actually look in history over the last 20 years, if we look at the market bottoms, Okay, so in, in tech rec in 2001, 2002, we looked at the final financial crisis in 08, 09, again in 16, roughly 16, 17, again 18, 19, COVID and so on. What's actually really interesting, these bars signify the inflows and outflows of money. So anything on the bottom is where investors are selling. Anything across the top is when investors are adding money into, their, into these investments. Well, what's interesting, the actual... Um, uh, declines or, or withdrawals, outflows of money in the market always happens at the bottom when people are most panicked. So they actually, they, they ride down this. And then again, I talked about it before, we just get tired. And when they throw in the towel and they sell, and the problem is they sell through these periods. Meanwhile, the markets are going up. Okay. Same thing here, you know, big outflows here. Look at the game that happened here. Same thing with these in here. Okay, so it's important if you actually own good quality investments, guys, you know, things will circle back. And again, just more long term. Again, I want to put some things in, in perspective is a key term I keep using today, you know, because again, we get caught up in the noise what's happening today. So it's like that old saying, you know, we can't see the forest through the trees. Okay, it's the same thing. When things are really dire, we forget that there's been good times. And sometimes, and I mentioned it, it can happen in 24 hours. So again, if we did this on Monday, we'd say, yeah, you know, we've had a really good run since June, but now we've done it two days later, 48 hours later, and our feelings might be a little bit different. So from our perspective, we try and take that emotion out of it and we say, hey, let's just look at the long term. Okay. And for some of you, and I mentioned this before, some people will say, hey, Wes, I don't have the long term. Okay. I unfortunately, I just, I, I don't have the, 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 the time like I had before. Folks, I think about long-term as one market cycle, eight to 10 years. Okay, some people think of long-term 20, 30 years. So I always think about from a bear market to a bull or from a bull to a bear, that kind of 10-year period. So if we look at that, you know, yes, we go through periods of contraction, but we also go through periods of growth, okay? And again, if you're invested and you're diversified, I'm gonna use this example here. Somebody might look at this, this is the NASDAQ, and they might say, yeah, but Wes, look at these three years, these big losses on the NASDAQ for three years in a row, okay? Well, this is tech companies. This was, if you remember, this was the dot-com. This was where companies had no valuations, okay? But look over here, if you bought the Dow Jones, more value-based companies, or even the S&P 500, yes, we went through two, three years of contraction, but then it was followed by significant gains and all the years before that we had gains. So look at this, if we actually go 2003 to 2000 and 14, you know, we had all these positive gains with the exception of one dip. So again, this is what I'm saying, that 10-year kind of cycle. So I think our, I think our families and our portfolios are extremely well positioned. And I'm going to circle back. I'm almost done here. Uh, I'm going to circle back and I want to actually talk about this. So I mentioned Peter Lynch, okay, this famous investor that we had before, okay? Well, Peter Lynch actually managed an investment for Fidelity and he managed, it was called the Magellan Fund. Okay, so he actually managed it from 1977 to 1990, which is why this chart is only 13 years and it's very dated. All right. But what I thought I would actually show here is the strategy, his strategy versus psychology. Okay, we talk about that. Okay, the emotional part of investing. Well, if you look at the S&P 500, the S&P 500 had growth, it had dips. Okay, it had a dip in here, again, had dips in here. Well, this Magellan Fund that he ran significantly outperformed the markets in good years but it also significantly underperformed the markets in certain periods of time, okay? And it dropped much more than the markets. You can see it significantly, but he had a tried, true, tested investment philosophy. And if you look over the 13 years, there was three to four times he dropped much more than the markets, but over the long run, he outperformed the markets by almost three to one. And again, if people were invested in this, this portfolio here, you know, if they invested, they might've said, I'm going to get out of it here. And they would have missed all these upside gains. 
So again, if we understand what we're investing in, we understand the opportunities, we can minimize some of those emotional or irrational decisions that actually could end up hurting Canadians over the long run. Okay, I think I have about three last slides here. So I'm, I'm a little bit long, but give me five more minutes and I'll wrap this up. So really quickly, this is just, again, one last chart in the S&P 500. You know, once the bear market, once 50% of the low was recovered, generally speaking, if we go back again over about 70 odd years, uh, markets didn't retest those lows. So we had lows in June. Okay, it feels like we've gone back to those lows, but we haven't. We're still higher than them. And again, as we work through some of these inflation and interest rate numbers, if we can get some a little bit of wind behind our back, when I say we as investors, me included, then we're going to be on that up, up, up trend of that leg. And this is just the example of what I talked about in the last webinar. So again, it goes back to what I was saying about you know, earnings per share profitability okay, versus the share price. So this is the example I used last time in 2022, this year, we've actually seen a significant pullback in the price of stocks. But the earnings, the, the, the slowdown in earnings hasn't been reported yet. So this is what I was saying on my example of ABC Widget Company, okay? They're anticipating slower earnings, so their share price goes down significantly. So this is what's happened here, and if we compare that to slowdowns and previous declines, you know, you can see we're kind of on the same turf as before, but those earnings just haven't caught up. But that being said, it's being priced into the market. And what's happening is this quarter, Roughly 60% of the, the, the companies that have reported have exceeded earnings, and 75% of everybody that's reported it has either met or exceeded. So again, we're actually getting that price in the market today, while we still have earnings to come out, which might not be as bad as what's being priced in. And these are small caps. So those are large caps I was showing. Here's some small caps. You know, we haven't seen, you know, small caps, you know, price at these valuations since early 2000. And again, these are other opportunities. So right now we're focusing on quality. You know, Percy Harris, the Percy Harris Global Equity that some of the, you on this call have investments in actually owns small cap companies, okay? The benefit as things turn around, we're gonna see some significant growth. So these are opportunities. So we're not really loading up in them right now, but we are, these are things that we're researching. We're saying, hey, is there an opportunity where we can catch that upside you know, as things turn around? Because there's lots, lots of bad news out there and therefore, the, the, the companies that would be considered some of these kind of small cap type companies, they've actually been significantly impacted. So their prices have contracted, they've gone down. And then as things stabilize and they have profits and so on, we're going to see that recovery. So yet again, another good opportunity. And last two slides, I showed this fear and greed index. You know, I showed it last time from May to July. And, you know, what I said is it went from extreme fear to fear. You know, it was neutral as of, you know, September 12th. So again, we're seeing the upward trend, this overall fear and greed index that's put out. And the upward trend line, you can see that it's actually contracted here. Okay. So we've actually seen it come down, you know, just after when I did the webinar, because of what's happened here in August, we saw a significant decline as of yesterday. But the, the upward trend line, or the trend line is upwards since, you know, May kind of June here. So again, we're seeing that fear and greed. It, it, you, can, you can see the greed piece. You know, when the markets got hot in July, you can see people got very you know, excited about it. Emotionally, they were happier because their statements they were looking at were more positive. Well, not a lot has changed in six weeks, guys. That's a very short period of time. So if we look long-term, you know, we could have a dip here, but that trend line over time will go up, okay? So when we see some of these markets like we saw yesterday, you know, for us, it's not, an, it's not a real surprise. You know, when I say it's not a surprise, we know the markets are going to go up and down. Yesterday was, a, you know, more of a, um, a significant pullback. But the four or five days previous, it was a winning streak. So really what happened is the, is the market basically eroded those three to four good days. You know, and those three to four good days were based on the U.S. Fed, you know, only increasing 75 basis points. So really what transpired is that week has just been flat. Okay. So I'm going to wrap up here. I have a couple of questions that have been coming in. So the first thing uh, I'd like to do is, is I have a couple of questions if you guys can take the poll or the survey. So the next session topics, if we can put those up, uh, I just want to get a sense really quickly what you would like to see covered in the next session. So and you can pick all, you can pick one, whatever you want to do. So market recap, economic outlook, tax planning tips, 
legacy and estate planning or other. And if there is something other, you can always just type it into the Q&A because again, just like I added the crypto kind of comments on it, I'd be happy to add other ones in there as well. Okay, so I'll give a couple seconds for everybody just to, just to uh, check it off. In the meantime, I'm going to check the uh, questions that people have typed in. And I'll actually, I only have time to answer two to three of them. Any other questions that come in that I cannot answer, I will actually answer uh, via email directly back to you. So again, if you have questions, Q and A's, please put it in. Um, as you're typing this in, one other thing, we are gonna do another session in November and then into the next year, we'll just do it every quarter. Uh, but again, I think these are timely, they're relevant. So we're trying to do more of them, you know, given this choppy market. Uh, so again, we will send out uh, a reminder, again, anticipated in November. Uh, we had a great uh, showing today. We had a lot of people registered, a lot of people attended. Uh, so really pleased that you know, people are finding these valuable. But again, I'd like to still get feedback. You know, give us your topics, give us your ideas. We can customize this. You know, this is really your time for us to, to chat about what's on everybody's mind. Okay. Okay, so as you finish up, like I said, I've had just a few of them come up here. So I'm gonna actually answer some of these questions. If you guys can just hang tight as I, as I chat and then we'll wrap up in about five minutes. So the first question I have is uh, we've had a question come in here about can can um, I provide an opinion on GICs? Uh, and it's a good question. I've actually been getting a lot of questions on GICs, okay? And, you know, GICs generally aren't the best form of investments because they don't keep up with inflation, unfortunately. All the interest you receive is fully taxable, okay? But now that they're getting to, you know, they're roughly on a one year, is right, just over 4%, 4.2, 4.3%, 4.4, depending. So they're getting attractive. Now, that being said, you know, if you can get 4% on a one year, or four and a half on a one year, inflation is seven to eight, we're still behind, okay? But I don't think that's the biggest issue. You know, if for whatever reason you have short-term cash for one year, then I don't think it's a bad thing. Where I think the risk lies with a GIC is the opportunity cost if markets turn around. So I've had some people that say, hey, why don't I just sell my equities and I'll buy GICs and guarantee myself 4%. Well, that is true. The drawback is I don't anticipate this market, this sluggish market to go on for another 12 months. So what if three or four or five months, you know, we go and all of a sudden, you know, things get better, inflation comes down, you know, the central banks, they ease on their, their interest rate hikes, all of a sudden the markets go like take off. You know, those individuals that have actually liquidated equities to buy GICs, they're locked in for another seven months until that one year is done. So I think it's really important. Like I said, I think GICs do make sense in some cases, but, you know, to rotate out of growth investments to something that's more conservative, the drawback is that, again, you could really miss that upside, especially if you're selling equities to do it. Your equities have been depressed, so you sell them, you crystallize that decline, and then when the, the markets go up, you're not participating to make that back. So you're essentially crystallizing that decline in the market, okay? Um, so I have another question here. Uh, so it, it's about um, interest rates increasing and the impact to the real estate market, which again, we touched on last time. You know, I, I do believe it's gonna get a little bit tougher on, um, on uh, uh, the real estate market, uh, just from a lending point of view. You know, I think if we go another 0.75 to 1% up on variable rates, you know, I think a lot of people are gonna be very squeezed uh, on their monthly payments, but I think they'll continue to make them. I, I don't think they're gonna default on mortgages by any means. You know, I think there's a lot of people right now that are looking at locking in mortgages. Um, I, had an, I have another person here that's actually just asking here about refinancing in February. So again, if we go back about refinancing, you know, in, in six months, uh, you know, should we should we sell out uh, investments to pay off the mortgage? You know, if you did that, depending on your interest rate, you know, you again, you guarantee, you know, four or five percent, whatever the interest rate is. But again, um, you know, you could be actually really hurting yourself uh, on the upside if the market's actually recovered by then. So I think for individuals that actually have mortgages that are going to be renewing, it's one of those things that we need to have that conversation because it depends if it's a fixed rate mortgage. It depends if it's a variable rate mortgage. You know, can you pay it off? And if so, what's the tax implications to raise the investor or the, the money to pay it off? Where are we in the market? So it's not quite as simple as just saying, yeah, just pay it off or just sell your investments and pay it off. 
It's very situational. You know, is it good debt? Are you tax deducting that debt? You know, is it is it bad debt? Do you have credit card debt at 30% versus your mortgage at five? So, you know, if you do have them coming up, I would suggest that you touch base with us and we can have, we can set up a call and we can have a more in-depth, you know, specific conversation to your um, individual um, needs in general, okay? Um, yes, actually, uh, I have another one here. I'm thinking of increasing our portfolio with an emphasis of dividend stocks and withdrawing some or all of the dividends to, act, to help with cash flow. What do you think? You know, that's, that is a great question. Okay, this is something I jotted down as well. So I think the big thing for a lot of our families is, you know, they're getting to retirement uh, or they're in retirement. So cash flow is really important. Um, and so I think there's two things with the dividends and then also cash flow. So we've had some families that'll say, hey, I want to take out some money, but unfortunately, I don't want to take it out at this time because of the markets. So if there are individuals that have these ideas, I would suggest that you touch base with us because there may be ways to raise that money in the portfolio without uh, impacting it significantly given the equity market decline, okay? So when individuals ask us to raise money, we always look at a number of different items. What's, again, back to what I said, what are the tax implications? Can we raise it from an investment that is actually hasn't had really any market decline? Uh, how, when do you need it? Is it immediate? Is it in a few months? Are there other ways to actually address that short-term need? So that's number one. Number two, based on the question about the dividends, you know, we're a big proponent of dividends as well. OK, um, dividends of, are another form of growth. But as this individual is asked, it's also another way to supplement some cash flow. So what I mean by that, you know, if you have a again, to used to use easy math, if you have a portfolio that's worth a million dollars and you're getting a three to four percent dividend, that's forty thousand, thirty to forty thousand dollars a year. So conceivably, you can tap into those dividends without actually touching the actual principal. So that is something that we can do. The challenge with just accessing dividends, and this is just something to keep in mind, dividends, they don't pay on a specified uh, month of the year. So from a cash planning point of view to actually offset just lifestyle expenses, sometimes it's a little difficult because your dividends could do this. So in some months you might get a lot of dividends or interest or distributions, and then in other months you might get less. So, in, so to get regular income, it might be a little bit difficult to plan your just your, your just your lifestyle expenses on a monthly basis. So what a lot of our clients do is they'll set up just a regular withdrawal out of the portfolio. Meanwhile, the dividends just get, re, get paid back in. So there's a couple of different ways to do it, but it's a very good question. And uh, yes, we can certainly actually uh, reassess the amount of dividends you're, you're receiving. And we can always kind of shift if we need to, if we want to really drive those dividend uh, payouts up. The challenge is we want to make sure some of those underlying investments are actually strong to pay those dividends because a lot of times we can get a lot of a lot of high dividends, but unfortunately the underlying assets aren't already great. So what happens is you get the dividends, but then we get a bigger sell-off on the actual underlying company. So we just want to make sure there's a good balance. So again, we can have that conversation separate and actually come up with a, a game plan if that's something that uh, is important to address that cash flow if anything has changed. Okay. One last question. I would love for Canadian US dollar. Uh, this is tough. You know, the Canadian, the US dollar has been increasing. You know, generally speaking, as um, as things get worse in the world, the greenback gets stronger, generally speaking. Okay. So what we're seeing obviously overseas, especially uh, the pound, I mean, these are at all time lows against the, the US dollar. Uh, so I would anticipate, you know, in Canada, you know, we actually had a little bit of wind at our bass because we're very much commodity and energy driven within the Canadian currency. But I think that's going to shift a little bit as things get a little bit more choppy. You know, I think the US dollar and, and you know, we saw it yesterday, you know, US dollar appreciated against Canada. And I would anticipate that, you know, in the short term, that will likely be the same, especially as they increase interest rates. So. Okay, guys. Well, listen. I'm gonna I'm gonna pause there. I just want to thank everybody for attending today. Again, we will do another one in November. If there are some topics that uh, or some comments I made today that you'd like to get some more clarity, feel free to send me an email. Again, we're we're always here, the full team. And uh, yeah, like I said, we'll look forward to the next one in about six to eight weeks. In the meantime, guys, take care, be safe, and we'll talk to everybody soon. Bye now. Mm -hmm.